Sarah. I had an amazing week. I had the greatest it reading week. It was so fun. Oh, you know, I forget how much I love category. Yeah, me too. And I, what's wrong with me that I forget? Because I read seven great books in a row, no notes. Like just, yeah. I and I didn't work hard. I was like, what's on the shelf? What have I bought at a bookstore or yeah, what's picked been up? Sent to me? Yes. Same. Same. Okay. <laughs> We're going to get down to it because we have a lot to say. Welcome, everyone, to Fated Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor. And this week, we're talking about category romance because every once in a while, we feel like talking about categories. Yeah. And it really, it's funny because, of course, we've done it before where, like, we're just talking about a trope and we, you know, kind of drop in a category. Mention a category. Right. Jen, what's a category romance? Okay, so... I'm like, sometimes I will say this. Hello, everyone who messages us on Instagram. I'm Sarah. I run the Instagram account. Uh, Eric runs the Tumblr account. I don't know what's happening over there. It's the Wild West. Send him love notes there. Jen runs the Twitter account. And now you've met us all. Yes. The, <laughs> there you the, go. Uh, but some people do comment often, well, not often, but frequently on the Instagram account. And they say things like, hey, you mentioned category romance what is it and never said anything more what is that so what's category category romances are the ones that are published now really only by harlequin back in the 80s there was silhouette some competing mills and boone if you're in um not in america um and what they are is there are certain lines right so harlequin intrigue harlequin historical harlequin desire And they are packaged in a certain way, right? Like they have like a purple back or a red or a yellow and they are shorter. One of the big, I think, key things is that they're shorter. They are usually stocked just for that month that they are on sale. So, you know, maybe there's four or six Harlequin intrigues every month. Um, And then they come out and they're only on the shelves for a really short period of time in a store, although they're probably always available on Harlequin's website or, you know, from like an online retailer if they still have them in stock. And the big appeal, I would say, of a category romance is probably length, wouldn't you? Like they're longer than a novella, but they're... 60 to 80,000 words. Maybe I don't not even, even think they, they don't even get close to 80. I don't yeah, think. I, I think, think they're, they're 60, like probably. 60 to 70,000 words, which to those of you who don't know about word count, that's probably like almost just under 300 pages. Like, yeah. Well, and I think some are shorter, you know, some are shorter than others, right? So like, I would say the longer ones, these intrigues are like 250 oh, yeah. pages. Oh, yeah. I've got, I mean, one of my presents is only 215 But pages. I think a so, desire yeah. and a presents are probably like 215. And they are, I think of it as like, I think of category as being like a romance laboratory. Meaning lots of authors start writing in category. Well, it used to be that that was like, how it was done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've obviously been doing these trailblazer interviews over the last two seasons. And most of the people who are, we have talked to have started in category. I mean, Sandra Brown, Nora Iris Roberts, Johansson. Iris Johansson, Catherine Coulter. I mean, because back in the day, it wasn't just... Harlequin in the mix, like there was Silhouette, there was Tapestry, there was Candlelight, there was so Love many. Swept. So Love many. Swept. And listen, I realized I was reading a paper presents, which I don't usually do these days. And like they still have the card in the middle with the, you know, click the, you know, check the box, list your address, join our club, we'll ship you books every month. I am tempted, let me tell you, but I think Eric would lose his mind (laughs) if once a month we got a box from Harlequin. Yeah. I mean, I think they also do a good job now of like these are packaged as ebook. You know, you can get like an ebook ebook subscription. Yeah. Also, P.S. I read a bunch of books this week from my public library. Yes. Because the library doesn't just get one book, they get the bundles. Sure. 
And they come through on your Kindle as like one file and you just power through. Power through a bunch of them. The other thing is Harlequin's backlist now, some of them are on Kindle Unlimited. Perfect. No notes. Exactly. Just like dive in and boom, you've got it. These lines are kind of ever-changing. They're not, like there's some that have been around forever. Harlequin Presents has been around forever. Harlequin Desire has been around One for million. Oh, since Gutenberg. Yes. <laughs> I believe that's the first thing the that was printed on the printing press. <laughs> the Bible and then Harlequin Presents. <laughs> and then there's like Harlequin Desire that's been around for a long time. But then things like Harlequin Historical or Harlequin Intrigue like kind of come in and out. Like of, Blaze, R.I.P. Oh. Blaze. I actually, in honor of this, did read a Blaze. This I read week. a Blaze too. I can't stop myself. They're amazing. Yes, they're so good. <laughs> the reason I said they're like a laboratory for romance is they're short, they're fast. Lots of different people are writing Harlequin, like right in well, one of the and lines. Many right? of our favorites, like oh, yeah. many of the people we talk about on mm-hmm. Faded Meets regularly, Naima Simone. Adriana yes. Herrera, Reese Ryan, Jill Shalvis, Lori Wilde. I mean, like, people who just, all, who write what we call standalones, right? Standalone novels, longer ones, are also writing Harlequins. I mean, category. Did, yeah. Or came up through it. But, I mean, Lori Wilde is a great example. She writes... Cowboy romances for Avon, I think. And she writes Harlequin. I mean, she writes four or five Harlequins a year. Yeah. I will read an occasional category, right? They're really how I started reading romance. The first romance I ever read was A Second Chance at Love. So they're really comfort, like deeply comforting to me as a reader. The challenge with them, of course, is that if you like us, Started reading them when you were very young, um, or rather many years ago. <laughs> um, then uh, they disappear yeah. really fast, yeah. and you can't find them anymore in print. Right. Um, and now, now of course they're you know they are preserved in some way in e, but it is really hard to find. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably talk about books today that you just can't find. Which is a big bummer. Yeah, you have these, like, I have vivid memories of, like, certain categories that I would, like, I loved it and I checked it out. And then you're kind of like, what was that? Now, now that so many things are available, like, you know, use, well, bless the used bookstores out there putting every single one of their used books into Amazon yeah. that you can buy because and thrift books. Uh-huh. Like, there are a lot of places now that, you know, Better World Books where you can find cataloged, right? Like, sort of, I'm looking for this specific thing and find it. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, um, they're ephemeral by nature. Yeah. um, No, there is a, there is a a desire that I read. I actually, I don't know that that's true. It could have been a desire. It could have been silhouette. But I actually, when I think about what I remember about it, I'm pretty sure it was desire because it was very sexy. Yeah. Um, that I read when I was a kid, and I would, I mean, like, I must have read it a dozen times, and really, honestly, like, and I could tell you the begin, the beginning, she's, like, on the front cover, she's, like, oh, I think I'd look under a Christmas tree, I think, (laughs) and on the back, and then at the very end, like, in the epilogue, she gives birth and he brings her to orgasm in the hospital, like, <laughs> as she's, like, sure. waiting. And I, like, how is it that I, like, these are the two things I know about this book, and I have looked for it. I have spent way more time looking for this book than I have ever spent on my own books. Like, <laughs> don't be telling people the secret, I have Sarah. not been able to find it. Oh, no, I mean, like, yeah, total no, totally. hours, thousands of hours, <laughs> thousands of woman hours. Now, here's, you know, I want to say one other thing, though, because everybody, you may or may not know that the Harper Collins Union, which is a subset of workers that Harper Collins are on strike. Um, it's a little over 200 
people who are uh, who have positions that are below management, below manager, um, and it's a variety of different departments that are impacted by this group. Um, HarperCollins is the only publisher that actually has a union, the only big five publisher that actually has a union. Um, and they're on strike for a number of different demands. We'll put links to all of the strike documents and the the HarperCollins Union social media so you can go check it out if you're interested. Um, but mainly their biggest ask, uh, aside from DEI initiatives and additional commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion at HarperCollins, is uh, a raise. And who doesn't want slash need that in this day and age, um, they are asking for a $5,000 base raise, which will bring their um, base salary from $45,000 a year to $50,000 a year. And I can tell you as somebody who lives in New York City that that is a extremely reasonable uh, number. And uh, $50,000 still means you need roommates and probably can't live uh, anywhere near where you work. And I would like to say before, before we talk about that, sorry, that I am in a union at my workplace, so I very much support the union. And I should say I am published by HarperCollins, and I support the union um, and their demands. So um, I am I just think that what we need to talk about today is uh, how you, what the union is asking for from readers and uh, people who promote books and people who talk about books like us. Um, they have asked that uh, reviewers, not review titles that are upcoming, um, that are HarperCollins published, but, and this is a big, important but, they have not called for a boycott. And I know that there's a lot of concern about that and a lot of questions about that. Um, and I want to say that there are new HarperCollins books coming out every week, and authors rely heavily on people purchasing their books in order for their career to be sustained and to survive and thrive. And I've said it a thousand times here and a thousand times on, not on the podcast. I'm always in support of authors. Um, so we encourage you to go and continue to purchase new books published by HarperCollins, particularly romance novels. There are two out next week from Megan Frampton and Joanna Shoup. And those are big favorites here. And you are not crossing a picket line if you buy books published by HarperCollins. We're about to unload a whole episode about Harlequin category romance. Harlequin, although it is owned by HarperCollins, these workers at Harlequin are not part of this strike and not part of this effort. And that is confirmed by the union. So, you know, we have had a lot of conversations and like there's some things like personally that like, I can do, like, so everyone knows, or maybe don't, I review for Kirkus. I did tell my editor I would not review HarperCollins titles. That's like a paid review. That's very clearly, to me, would be an example of crossing the picket line. But talking about HarperCollins titles on the podcast is something we have continued to do, kind of under the assumption, right, like under that bucket of they have not asked us to boycott. It's been a tricky thing for us, right? Like, we really want to support the union, but we also really are firmly committed to supporting authors if it is not, like, if there's no ambiguity there. So if you are an author out there and you are looking for ways to support the union besides um, amplifying what's going on, um, I highly suggest making a donation to the Strike Fund. We're asking you if you are so inclined to, if you can give money, and if not, there's a letter that you can sign um, that anyone can sign as a reader, even as just a, a person who cares about it. Let them know you're a reader and you support their efforts. And we'll continue as we go forward whenever we mention a HarperCollins title to remind you uh, if the strike continues. In the meantime, we're going to be talking about Harlequin categories today, and that is going to be a real fun ride. Let's talk about what we read. Okay, well, can we just talk about why category is so yes. great, though? Yes. So, part of the joy of category for me over the last, like, week has been, um, you know, I'll finish my day, you know, and days are whatever. You go to your, you sit at your desk, you do your job, you, um, you get, you come home, you feed your kids, you, like, do the thing with your family or, you know, you do all the extra bits, you do the housekeeping, the whatever. You do all the stuff. 
And then you crawl into bed at like 10.30 <laughs> and like, or 10 o'clock. And by midnight, you've finished I know. a book. And it's just, you have torn through it. Yes. The pages have flown by. And amazing. This week's episode of Fate of Mates is sponsored by Desiree Nicoli, author of The Haven Cove Duology, featuring Call to the Deep and Song of Lorelei. Song of Lorelei is out this week. Okay, everybody, listen, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard of in my life. Everyone knows I love swimming, but maybe not if I knew that there was dangerous mermaids out in the ocean. The ocean is just monster soup, Jen. Yeah, but listen, it's always men, and I'm totally digging that in this case, our heroine, Lorelai Roth, has been saved from a shipwreck. She's the only survivor, and this handsome Killian Quinn, a fishing boat captain, has saved her and has pirated her away or spirited her away or whatever they do to their little cabin. She's cold. She's in wet clothes. I get it. I'm with you. So she's like, this man is a snack, only really a snack, because it turns out that she is descended from a group of, like, people-eating mermaids. Whoa. Whoa. She's she's the monster. I love this so much because it's always that he's the monster. And I'm just like, no. Taylor Swift song. Huh, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. She's the problem. (laughs) This is taking the finger and putting it in our charcuterie board, and I love it. So anyway, (laughs) listen, no, this is amazing. So in the first book, Right They Meet, she has to come to terms with who she is. The second book, which is out this week, Song of Lorelei, has her sort of like— I mean, she can't eat him. She has. They have to live happily ever after. Obviously, they're going to live happily ever after. I believe in Lorelai and <laughs> Killian. I do. So anyway, she has to c- help, like, kind of figure out how she can overcome her, you know, sinister craving for human flesh to have happily ever after with her handsome sea captain who saved her. Oh, my God. Talk about conflict. Well, Liz, it, <laughs> four days. This is amazing. You can read the Haven Cove duology right now. Call to the Deep, book one, is discounted for two weeks and on sale for 99 cents at available retailers. And Song of Lorelei is out now. Thanks to Desiree Nicoli. I need to say that again. Thanks to Desiree Nicoli for sponsoring the episode. So I, Sarah, I had a lot of fun. One of the things I tried to do this week, and then we can talk about titles, is... Okay, so I said I, like, picked up stuff that I had, like, just, like, in my house. Yeah. But I was also really trying to read. I tried to read a book from lots of different lines. So I read, I read an intrigue, a desire, a presents, a historical, and, wow, a blaze. May they rest in peace. You did more work than me. I read a bunch of presents. Listen. (laughs) And a blaze. Pre- and I read, I want to talk about a silhouette desire from back in the day. Amazing. All right. So how do how do we want to do this? Um, well, why don't we talk about I don't know. Well, you read so many. Why, well, I why read don't so you many. talk about like what have you read all of these lines before? I mean, I'm sure you've read all these lines before, but like no. wait, is there something that you've never read that you and you were like, oh, I learned a thing. I read a okay, I read a Harlequin historical for the first time. And I have been keeping my eye on these. Is it about a va- a Viking? <laughs> yeah. It, listen, wait. I'm gonna read this to you because everybody I could not be wait, more is it for real about a Viking? Uh yes, ma'am. It is called A Nun for the Viking Warrior. Stop it. <laughs> I'm not gonna stop it. I'm never gonna stop it. <laughs> By Lucy Morris. And you know what's great is a lot of people were like, that doesn't really look like a nun. And I was like, you're saying that like it's a bad thing. Like what? It's amazing. <laughs> a nun for the Viking warrior. It's 9, 918 AD. And oh my God. This book starts with Amy. She's our nun um, ah. in her uh-huh. nunnery. And the Vikings are literally They're knocking, come, like, Panging in the door with, like, a huge tree. Like, they are banging their way in. Uh-huh. And they are coming for her because she has been promised in marriage by her evil father, Lothair, which I also enjoyed, I'm not going to lie to you, to a Viking, Jorand is his name. Uh-huh. And, uh, listen, he comes, he bursts down the door. He and his men break down the door with a battering ram, essentially, and he's like, hey, girl, hey, 
uh, <laughs> here's some paperwork. And now he can't paperwork? read. He can't read, but the mm-hmm. paperwork essentially is like, you need to marry this man. It's your father. Sure. And um, listen, it's great. They get married essentially like right on the property. Well, it works out too because the Vikings, they weren't Christians. So who cares? She's a nun. Well, yeah, exactly. And there's he's this, like, what is this? He's, all this course, means to me is that you're wearing a lot of clothing. Here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's like a not in, you know, she's not really sworn in yet or whatever it's called. Uh, she's a novice. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Yep. So it's great. How do like, you solve a problem like Maria? You they, bang it out. Yeah, of course. They have this great conversation where, I mean, somehow they speak the same language and he's like, you can raise the child in your religion. And she's like, but you've been baptized. And he's like, come on, I'm a Viking. That was just for show. It's honestly, the whole thing is amazing. I loved it from beginning to end. I can't even say enough wait, about it. Wait, wait, wait. So can I ask a question about yes. sex? Yeah. Because what I was surprised by was how quickly all the characters in these books have sex. Yeah. Because I feel like when I was a kid, it was like... Took forever. Oh, took forever. But now, like, when I when you read them back to back to back, you're like, actually, everyone is banging all yeah, the time in these right. books. No, sure. They do it pretty fast. I mean, it's not like right the night he carries her away or whatever. But, sure. um, yeah, no, they're doing it. And she enjoys it. The big drama is... You know, she has, I feel like she can trust him. And of there's course. like a, his, like there's a woman who is supposed, that she knows is like in love with him and he has no clue. And, you know, uh-huh. he has nightmares and he can't tell her about them. Listen, the whole thing was just, it was everything I wanted and more. I'm and a fan. I, yeah, it was just like, here's the other thing I think about a category. Like, you and I are on record yeah, for not really enjoying these like low conflict books where nothing happens. Oh well, that's not these books. No, I and I just <laughs> had this moment where I was like, when people are like, "I'm in a reading slump," what should I do? I was like, "You should pick up a Harlequin category romance. That's what you should do because here are books that are not afraid of plot." Of, I mean, I read it, it, across lines. That would be like my common thing. Like, here are books that are not afraid of plot at all. Right. You know, what am I going to have this nun? I'm going to break down the door with a battering ram. That's well, going to be the opening of, all, of this book. As you know, I will always support the breaking down of a door. Sure. I mean, that's a McLean special. So <laughs> somebody somebody actually commented on that at some point recently, like sent me a message <laughs> and was like, you know, all your heroes break down doors. And I was like, is that true? And then I was like, you yes. know what? I'm going with it. That's now in everything. It's great. All of the nuns are like sitting around like watching the door to the, you know, they, and they're like, there's no way that they could break in. Because here's the way it goes. It's like, how do I get through this door? And yes. then his reptilian brain is like, the only way out is through. Yes. Just, that's it. <laughs> now, I have two other Harlequin historicals I have not read, but I'm pretty excited about it because I had such a great experience with a nun for the Viking warrior. And that is... Redeeming the Reclusive Earl by Virginia Heath. Oh, which, nice. Virginia Heath writes a great book. Yeah, right? He lost it all in a horrific fire, and then he catches this woman digging holes on his estate. I think they're fossils, but I think they're sexy fossils. So well, I'm going to read it. in 215 pages, how many fossils could there be? Exactly. Then? And then compromised by a, into a scandalous marriage by Listen. Lydia San, San Andres. Oh, I love it. See, I didn't even know she wrote histor- Harlequin Historicals. She has this one and then a new one coming out, which I will put on the show notes. It is a terrific looking, really good looking um, cover with a handsome man in like a fedora. Listen, I'm for it. Me too. So here's what I was fascinated by in this. I read... I have two presents on my list for today. Okay, do yours, then I'll do my presents. And what I'm really fascinated by in this is how I said this to you. Ordinarily, (laughs) I don't want an info dump on page one, Mm, right? Or not page one, but like in the first chapter, right? Like, I don't want to know all about everybody's backstory. But when you've only got 200 pages to work with, you got to get a lot of that shit just out of the way, (laughs) right? Especially because in presents... The backstory is always something really insane related to somebody's, your family, right? Like, a hundred percent. It's like, or not, let me rephrase that. The backstory (laughs) is basically like, you know what's happening with Harry and William and the Royals right now? It's just with, but with normal people. (laughs) Like, just, 
everybody's got issues with their siblings. Everybody's got issues with their family. Yeah. And everybody's like a, a Greek billionaire living on an island with a private helicopter. Fine. I mean, since you brought up Greek billionaires, I know the job, sir. So what I really enjoy, aside from the titles of all of these books, which is, oh you know, yeah, state of your body in the, <laughs> you know, nationalities location. <laughs> There's a really funny, I will dig it up, like, sort of, like, Harlequin, like, you know. A, a title generator, yeah, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so, um, what I, so I, but what I really love is these authors, like, they're so good at, first of all, there's always a great meet cute. This particular meet cute happens, like, in the rain, outside of a wedding, where, so the hero is watching the bride run away. Nice. Which happened in a prior book in the series, obviously. Sure. Of course. And But then the bride runs away, and then out the door comes the bridesmaid, and he's like, I can't look away. I'll just pick and that then, one off. you're like, yes, I'm in. And then, then we do the, like, why is he standing in the rain? Right. Turns out he's brothers with the groom, half-brothers with the groom, but they don't talk. And he's there for, rom- like, pure romance reasons. Sure. Okay, this is Pregnant in the Italian's Palazzo. Of course. Right, the- Amanda Sinelli. Amanda Sinelli. Mm. She can do the job. Yeah. I've read many, I've read several books by Amanda, and she is, these books are extraordinarily fun. So this book, this series is about three brothers. Um, and <laughs> the... They're uh, sto- they're <laughs> stolen in her wedding gown is the first one. The billionaire's last minute marriage is the middle one, and then pregnant in the Italian's palazzo is the finale to this sure. trilogy. Um, it's like three like lost siblings, uh, children of a Greek billionaire who are all like in. They have to like. It's a will. There's a will situation. There's always a will situation, or often a will situation. Always. Um, and their father dies, and he leaves his billions to the first son who is married for a year. Great. Of course. I mean, I love it, right? Yes. So, okay. Um, anyway, uh, so this book, so the the hero, she, the heroine is, the fa- is a fashion designer. She's plus size. She's very curvy. A plus. Very excited about this. She um, is the bridesmaid to the runaway bride who takes off, except there's a problem because when she gets out, uh, Aria is her name, she has to go, she's like got plans. She's got to get to Italy for something. Sure. Or London, no, she's from London. She has to get to London for for something. He's Italian, it's in the title. And so um, (laughs) she comes out of the church and she's like, oh shit, or it's not church, it's City Hall, but she comes out and she's like, oh shit, they left. Like, yeah. And my bag and my passport and all my clothes are in this runaway bride's apartment. And I don't have, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And so she's sort of standing in the rain. And then the hero's like, I'm, I want her. <laughs> I want her. Yes. So he walks up to her. He's like, hey, do you have a problem? A paparazzo jumps out. He has a little bit of a panic attack. It's fine. It all works itself out. And then she's, and then he's like, Why don't I give you a ride? And now, I know what you're thinking out there. You think he wants to give her a ride to the apartment. No, no. That's not that kind of ride? He wants to give her... Well, that too. He wants to give her a ride to London. He'll just get her home. Of course. On his private jet. Apparently, you don't need a passport on your private jet. I don't don't know. It's fine. It doesn't matter. And so, chapter two, we're on this private jet. They are banging it out on this airplane. It's... Amazing. Amazing. She's like, I've never had an orgasm, like, with a partner. He's like, I got you. (laughs) I, (laughs) listen, listen. So then he turns up, they get to, they get to London and he's like, why don't you come to Italy with me? Like, you're Uh a fashion designer, come to Italy, come to Italy for a a week. Like, just, let's not, let's not end this here. And she's like, "Mm, I think though... I think we should just leave the, like, the fling on a private jet where it needs to be. Right. And so he's like, fine, but here's my, here's my direction in Florence. And if you ever get, find yourself there, you look me up. And uh, she turns up 
And you know what, Jen? She's feeling a little queasy. I, I wonder what could have happened to her <laughs> on her little mile-high trip. I'm and what sorry. I love about categories, and this will not, like, I really want everybody, I feel like after five seasons, you know I am not. This is me being very authentic. What I love about them is, like, it's just, it doesn't matter. They give, like, no fucks. No, it's like, at some point, there's a discussion of birth control. She's like, I'm a, I am have an implant. He's like, great. I don't have any condoms. She's like, it's fine. I haven't had sex and whatever. They sure. do it. And then later, a doctor's like, well, the implant's only, so it's 96% effective. So, <laughs> I mean, and then you're like, yes, okay, I be- yes, secret baby on a plane. <laughs> That's the title. There you go. I I don't know why they can have that for free. Secret baby on a plane. (laughs) I think this is the part I I was thinking Harlequin presents especially to me. It's like we've talked before about like romance is like a fantasy. Uh Harlequin presents is like, listen, everything about this is fantabulous. Turn it up to 11 on all of it. Uh, Yes. Every every single dial is just like Like, a little kid being like... Listen, it's so freeing as a writer to yes. read these books and just fall into them and love them because yeah. it feels like when you're writing, you're writing along, you're writing along, and then you get to a point where you can go one direction or the other. Yeah. And, like, the real question is what would Harlequin Presents do? Yes. Because Harlequin Presents will always go toward the 11. Yes. And it's, honestly, it's so fun to read. I mean, that's the thing I feel like. What I realized this week is, like, I... Love, I love romance, but like romance is fun to read when it was when I was young, it was fun to read. And like re- reading categories just brings it all back for me. So I am going to talk very briefly about a book I know I've mentioned before, which is The Marriage That Made Her Queen by Callie Anthony, which is she has to, um, you know, she's the queen, but like she has to marry to really get the crown or whatever. And she's like really pissed about it. So she shows up at her wedding in a black wedding dress. <laughs> what a there's literally nothing else you need to know about that book. Like, have you ever heard it. anything as great as that? No, you have not. You haven't. Um, I also read a Harlequin Presents. I want to talk about it before we go back to you, which is um, by Caitlin Cruz. It's called Her Deal with the Greek Devil. And the, I don't the think... Greek devil. I don't think there's anyone. Caitlin Cruz, it's like... I, I sh- Okay, here. This is the Caitlin Cruz story I wanted to tell. I was uh-huh. at Goodreads at some point, and I was looking up a, a YA book I really loved when I was a kid called The Princess Routine. And in this book, it's like a YA romance where, like, a beautiful, like, sort of, you know, I'm just like a princess, I'm really pretty, and all this stuff, like, ends up on a river rafting trip and falls in love with her brother's best friend. Uh-huh. And I love this book. I actually have, like, bought a couple used copies of it, and... Caitlin Cruz is the one other person who's like left a Goodreads review of this. And I was like, this is why I love this woman's books because she and I were that's amazing. We're like read stories on the same, like, like I literally was like, perfect. Right. So, anyway, in this book, and I, I'm not going to kid you. I read it on ebook and I'm like, I might need a paper copy of it in case the world ends and I need to read it again. His name's Constantine. Her name's Molly. Um, they were step siblings back in the day, but her his dad was like a, the worst person in the world, and it was uh-huh. her mom got like and was like a housekeeper. He married this housekeeper, and Molly was a teenager, and he just hated his dad so much. And he and this woman was really nice to him, and he hated her for being nice, and he hated Molly for being like so sweet. And Molly would, like, tell him all of her stories, and he would go and blab them to the tabloids. And at one point, he's like, I didn't even take money for it. I just wanted to hurt you because you and your mother, like, stood in for this thing. Well, they get divorced. Molly goes her way. She becomes, of course, like, the world's most famous supermodel. And I appreciate that Caitlin Cruz was like, there weren't even supermodels anymore. But, like, it didn't matter. She was one. Nope. And he has been trying to ruin her and her mother— for, like, however long, and he brings... And finally, Molly puts it all together, right? Oh, he's... Listen, I I loved this book, even though I'm about to tell you the most terrible things, because here, you know I love groveling. I was of like, course. The more an asshole he is, yeah. the more he's going to have to grovel at the end, and right, I'm going to The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Sure. So, listen to this. He essentially has ruined her mother and almost bankrupted Molly because she keeps 
you know, bailing her mom out. Molly finally uh-huh. figures out that he's behind it. He calls her to this, like, family home in Greece where they were teenagers together and is basically like, if you want, you know, me to, like, bail you out of the situation, you have to be my mistress. No, uh-huh. Of course. And she's like, you're a dickhead. But, okay, I'll think about it. But, of course, like, she's back three days later and has to agree. And he, <laughs> Sarah... This is the worst thing I've ever read, and I was totally delighted by it. I'm a terrible person. Tell me you're not. He was like, okay, great. Take off your clothes, and you are you are not allowed to have clothes anymore. Just, like, walk around naked <laughs> for in our house because there's no staff or anything. It's just me, just, and you're a supermodel, so you don't care. He forces her to walk around naked. She's like, all right, sure, fine. I'm, I'm naked in front of people all the time. What do I care? <laughs> and I was like, God, I hate him, and I love this. What's wrong with me? <laughs> like, I loved it. Like, I literally loved it. Wait, but does he really, really grovel hard? Yeah, I mean, she destroys him, and it was satisfying, and he is literally, like, it's great. Like, it also really preys upon one of my all-time favorite, like, hardwired-in things from when I was a kid. I'm just gonna, like, spoil it. Everybody is, um, she's a virgin. (laughs) And when he figures it out, by fucking her, of course, Uh he is, like... Everything I thought I knew about the world is wrong if she's a virgin, listen, which is so listen, wrong. That's the best. I mean, it's <laughs> terrible. Listen, it's terrible, and yet it okay. was great. It's terrible, but also when they're like, I thought I yes. was not, like, I thought like yes. I was going to be, you know, whatever number, a notch on your bedpost, and I'm number one, and they're just like, McCreeve brain. I mean, he literally, like, it's great. Like, it's go full static brain. Yeah. I think the big difference between, like, this book now versus this book uh-huh. in the 80s is... He's not mad. She, he's not, like, slut-shaming her. He's just like... No. He, and she gets the best of him at the end, right? Like, everything is sort of... She's like, yeah, sure, fine. I, I actually wanted this, too. And it, it was really great. And I will tell you, though, I was... I'm embarrassed to tell you how great it is because someone out there is like, Jen, that's totally fucked up. And you know what it is? And it was awesome. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, it just is. It just is. Listen, well, in this pregnant, this pregnant in the Italian's palazzo, she wants to go back to London. And he's like, oh, that's cute. No way. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're in the Italian's palazzo so, now. And now, now she lives <laughs> in that Italian's palazzo. This week's episode of Faded Mace is sponsored by Lumi Labs, creators of the Microdose Gummy. So Microdose Gummies, you've heard us talk about them before on Faded Mates. They deliver a perfect entry-level dose of THC that helps you feel just the right amount of good. And they really do make you feel just like a little, for me, a little bit calmer. Right now, it's January. There's a lot going on. It feels like we all came down off of the holidays feeling... Well, I- Oh, uh, like the whole everything has out. to start up again. It feels really stressful. And um, microdose gummies are just a little bit of like, they just take the edge off. And it's a great experience. Um, Jen uses them to sleep. I use them to take the edge off when I'm feeling particularly, you know, vib- vibrating <laughs> at a pitch, which, you know, everyone tell you I do sometimes. Um, but we know people who take them to for creativity and people who take them, um, you know, before they get on a plane. Which I highly recommend everybody. So <laughs> to learn more about microdosing THC, just do a quick search online or go to microdose.com where you can use the code FADEDMATES to get free shipping and 30% off of your first order. And if you're considering order for the first time, might I recommend the cotton candy flavor, which I enjoy. Cotton candy. We've never talked about that before. Nice. It's new. I like it. Uh, so, as always, links about Lumi Labs and about all of our sponsors can be found in show notes. But again, that's microdose.com, code Faded Mates. Thanks to Lumi Labs for sponsoring the episode. Okay. I want to talk about um, Tara Pammy. Oh, she's great. Tara Pammy's so good. Yeah. Okay. So, I read uh, The Secret She Kept in Bollywood, um, which is terrific. So this is a celebrity romance, so you all know this is, like, destined to be sure. perfect for me. The heroine of this uh, this book is a costume designer, and her brother is a film director, a Bollywood film director. And okay. again, we know this because 
Prior books. <clears throat> she has two brothers who are in prior books. Oh, can I also say the other thing that I love about these books? Whenever they're the two brothers who've been married, who are married in the prior books, they're always like wandering through these books very quickly with their pregnant wives or their wives who have children. Like they're yes. everybody's got babies in book yes. three. Yes. Oh, hundred um, percent. And it's just like what I love about it is not the baby part. Like you don't have to look. Everyone knows I'm on the record about my feelings about babies and romance. But the um what I what I love about it is like these authors know the job so well because they know that readers, many readers are going to be like, but what happened to those two? Right. Right. And like they figure out how to do reader care and feeding yes. in 215 pages. Yes. You guys, it takes me 215 pages <laughs> to get to read and, reader care and feeding. I, res- I, you will be hard pressed to find a better example of how to tell a romance story in a straight shot. Like, yes. you know, an, an arrow from a bow. Uh-huh. The way these presents and other category authors do the job. It's just, it's a masterclass. Anyway, Tara Pammy is fabulous. She, so the heroine, like I said, is a costume designer. Her Bollywood film director, her brother, has asked her to come and do all the costumes for this movie that he is shooting. And it the movie features a young girl, a 12-year-old girl, and so, you know, the, she gets there for the table read, and she's never met any of these characters. And she sees the 12 year old girl like across the room, and she immediately recognizes her as the baby that she gave up for adoption <laughs> no when way. she was 17. Yeah, of course. Sure. <laughs> so, 100%. And that baby still has the same name. Like, she the, she named the baby, and then the baby was, like, adopted by another, bo- like, a Bollywood star who recently passed away and whose widowed husband, Simon, is now a single dad of a 12-year-old. Except, Jen, I left out the most important part, which is actually the day before, she has a one night stand. Like she has a oh no, not the day before. She she sees the child. She realizes what's happening. She realizes, like, oh fuck. Like, yeah. This is the other thing. I feel like when presents authors like put these stories together, like they're just the web of it is so perfect, right? Yes. The drama of yes. the child who is in my brother's Bollywood movie which I am designing costumes for, is also the baby I gave away. And I have to deal with this reality and all the, like, fucked up mental shit that is happening because of this reality right now in the lobby of this building. Yes. Like, she walks, literally walks out of the table read, has a breakdown. I mean, sure. Believable. Yes. And this hot dude, Simon, a pro, like comes upon her and he's like you're like in a state can i help you like are you okay yeah and she's like she of course doesn't tell him because it's a scandal and it's terrible and she what she she's not going to tell a stranger but she is going to have sex with this stranger right now of course she is to feel feelings to feel something yes to what feel a- good in some way and it's going to be the greatest sex of anyone's life <laughs> and then the he's next gonna day, be, yeah. he's going to walk into the film party with his child. He is the adopted father of this yes. child. So here's the and thing. And then he's like, "Yeah, oh, shit. And then she tells him, here's the other thing. Nobody holds anything back here. Tara Pammy doesn't have the page count for that. <laughs> She's like, all right, yeah. Now the heroine is going to tell the hero that she is the biological mother of his adopted daughter. <laughs> Listen, so there's like a task. I sometimes when I'm editing, um, I ask my authors to do, or I kind of do it in my brain, which is like, what's happening chapter by chapter, right? I'm sure uh-huh. all authors do this. And I'll be, I'll be honest, sometimes it's like nothing's happening, right? And my point is like, look, if nothing's happening, if you're like, they went to the farmer's market, you know, like what? Yeah. What is this chapter for? What's it doing? This is, but this is the yes. This is right? the 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 important piece of of writing is that every scene 
should be connected by like but or as a result of this. Yes, or and not just reveal. like and then and then and then, right? And sometimes I'm kind of like what I'm trying to say is like if you have too many chapters that are info dump or if you have too many chapters where like nothing's happening, like that's not good. But could you imagine making one of these for Harlequin Presents? You'd yep. be like, <laughs> no. Chapter one, 17 major things happen all at once. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this, 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 and this. And you know what? Unbelievable. It's perfect. But then it's like... It's perfect. It's perfect. what's so amazing is the the spring. My editor always says to me, like, it's about, like, winding the spring tight enough yes. in the first act. So... You know, the first, like, in this case, 70 pages, so that as the, when you let it go, it just shoots everything in, yes. like, forward. Yes. And the the spring is wound so tight in these books. Yeah. So, like, the moment that they realize, in this case, like, <laughs> she is the biological parent That's amazing. Of no, listen. His 12-year-old adopted daughter. And they've had the best, they've just had the best sex of their life. Sure. You're like, and they all have to be together. Because, like, of he does, like, th- this child is now in her brother's film, right? So, it, it's just such These a mess. authors have no fear. And I love no, it. Like, right? Pure fearlessness. Yeah, it's and amazing. It's amazing. Okay, so I have... Three more I want to talk about. <laughs> like, I know we're, like, really doing a lot. Okay. okay. So, you're done hard about Harlequin Presents. You have more. Should I, no, like... I'm done. I'm okay. done with Presents. Okay. So, I... Presents are for you, by the way. I will just say, Presents are for you if you like international travel, <laughs> secret babies. Yes. And um, billionaires. Yes. Um, okay. Well, that helps me. Speaking of billionaires, I'm going to talk about... Um, a book called Billionaire Mo- Makeover by Catherine Garbera. And this is a Harlequin Desire, which were the kind of my favorite back in the day. They're really like a desire. And I, this went by this week because a woman I follow on Twitter named Brie, um, it's at Brie unabashedly, was sort of raving about it. And I was like, as it turns out, I'm looking to read some good presents this week, some good categories. So I'll check this out. Uh-huh. And it is the first in a series Call, where these three friends from college have a business in Chicago as image consultants. And in book number one, um, Olive is our heroine, and she was a mean girl back in college, but she's been trying to mend her ways. And she gets called to be, to give a makeover to um, CEO billionaire of this brewery. I also have to tell you, I don't think, given the description of his job, he really is a billionaire. I think he's maybe a millionaire. <laughs> Bring back millionaires. It's okay. I actually maybe he won the mega million. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I had a joke this week on on Twitter that was like, all you need to know about romance is that billionaire is a common noun for man. <laughs> um, uh, his name's Dante perfect. Russo, and he went to college with Olive. She doesn't recognize him because back in college he was Danny, and he was kind of schlubby, and he had this huge crush on her, and she was super mean to him. And it takes a while to find out what's what was mean. But what's really interesting about this book, and I really loved it, is that they are both, like, trying to be better people than they were in college. She was really aware she was a mean girl and wants to be better. He was kind of like, I was a pushover. I thought I really loved this girl, but what did I really know about her? I just had her on a pedestal. And, you know, then he went out on, like, a tear of being kind of like a, like, kind of man whoring around. And, you know, he wants to be better. And so, but... Like, they bring out the worst in each other, and he actually is kind of like, I could get my revenge on her right now. She doesn't recognize me. and But he decides not to do it because he really likes her, and she seems to really like him, and he can tell she's different. And it was honestly a really—it took me a little bit to get into it, um, only because I think I was kind of like, wait, are these two nice people? (laughs) That's terrible. (laughs) They are. Um, The other thing, though, I will tell you is um, the setup for the future books in the series is pristine. And I read the description of book number three and immediately listen to how desperate I am to read this book. It doesn't come out on Kindle until the end of this month, but you can get it from the, like, in paper from the Harlequin website early. Oh. Oh. 
And I was like, well, shit, I need these books. So I ordered them from the Harlequin website. That's how excited I am to read the next two books in this series. The second one's out, but the third one's the one I was like, I literally read the description and was like, oh, because we meet her friend and her boyfriend in book number one. And then we find out what's really going on in the description of book number three. And I was like, yeah, so it's great. Billionaire makeover. That just means man, man makeover. Billionaire makeover. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) It was great. Perfect. Okay. So you brought up Models. (laughs) Models. <laughs> and have I ever confessed my secret love no. on uh, Fade of Mace? No. You know it. You know I love a military romance. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I have one and next. It's, you know, listen. <sighs> and we sure. live in a time when there is a military industrial complex, and it's a lot. I Um, personally don't understand why the military-industrial complex, which clearly has a romance division, has not hired us (laughs) (laughs) to help. There's the Reacher division. To just step in. There's the Marvel division and the romance division. Exactly. (laughs) We're right here. We really could step in and be like, let's, we're going to, we're here to help with toxic masculinity. That's what we're here for. That's what Jen and Sarah can give you. Yes. Um, Anyway. Listen, there's a Harlequin Blaze series called Uniformly Hot. And I say hot because it ends with an exclamation point. Yes. <laughs> it's a sexclamation point, you guys. Romance is so pure. First of all, find the person who invented, who named it Uniformly Hot exclamation point <laughs> and give them a solid bonus because that's just great. Um, and second of all, when I tell you I have read every one of these books <laughs> in my secret cave, I am not lying. But it is five seasons in, and that is my sh- my truth. I'm I'm telling you the truth. Um. So anyway, I want to talk about Model Marine by sure. Candace Havens, which is a great title because. It has a double meaning. (laughs) Now, are these older? Are these new? Yeah, they're all from 2011. It's like they were, it was a year of uniformly hot exclamation point at our gift. What a gift. There's another one called Her Last Line of Defense by Marie Donovan that is just chef's kiss. But okay. And the back cover copy. I don't, I don't, we don't usually talk about that cover copy, but this is one, I'm sure you've seen these, Jen, where Harlequin had the, the like, the, it was like a template, and it was like, subject, Captain Will Hughes, oh, U.S. Yeah. Marine Corps, current status, on assignment in NYC, suddenly recruited to shed the uniform, exclamation point, mission, serve as a model, muse, and man toy, without running afoul of the general obstacle. Hannah Harrington, Fashion World, It Girl. Oh, I could not love this more. <laughs> so wait. There's so, no way. Oh my God, it's so good. All the male model. All right, Hannah is a... <laughs> all right, sorry, I love it. Like, so pure. It's so, so good. good. <laughs> Hannah is a fashion designer. It is Fashion Week. Sure. And all the male models in <laughs> I love how you can't even like get it out. It's so amazing. <laughs> all the male models in her show. No, you you can't we can't understand your words. You have to I'm calm sorry. down. You have to calm down. All the male models in her show are in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Were they partying too hard the night before? Listen, Jen, who cares? <laughs> Oh, wow. It's so perfect. <laughs> anyway. But Will also has a nice body. <laughs> and sure. she's like, listen, I'm having an emergency. And I need you to just be a male model in my fashion week show. Like, this is fashion week, Will. <laughs> and he's like, 
I'm here, like, I, I'm a man with a job. And yeah. she's like, no, no, but I really need you here to help me with this. And it goes on from there, and it is an absolute delight. It's incredibly sexy. And, like, he, like, inspires her to, like, design clothes that no one has ever designed for or something. It doesn't matter. Sure, it doesn't the point matter. is they are banging it out a lot, and it's really terrific. It's a real joy to read. Um, and so, yeah. And, and of course, like, I don't know what I, I think what I love about, um, when I love about these books is like, there is a sort of sense of like, the military is just sort of, it's like wallpaper. Yeah. Right. Like, it's fine. Sure. Like, Will just like, can't, like, it, the, he can't be a male model, obviously, because he's like a serious person. Sure. And male modeling is not for serious men for serious who have men. been in combat. No, of course not. Of course. So amazing. And All he, right. It's just <laughs> that's great. Just terrific. And she, at one point, she's just like, just get out there. It's fine. Like they just like they like hot like stern men. I'm sure they taught you that in the military. Yes. <laughs> and he's like, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so I don't know where to go next because I have a military romance or oh. I have an old blaze. Wait, do you have this? Oh, yes. We have the same one. God, because we okay. talked about it. Oh, okay, do the military and All then right, we'll that do makes this. sense. Look at it. I love this. All right, so um, this book is a Harlequin intrigue, which I've never read a Harlequin intrigue before, but I would definitely read more. I think um, Brock, Suzanne Brockman came up through intrigue. Okay. It is called, I read, Alaskan Christmas Escape by Juno Rushton. <laughs> Juno. Juno Rushton. That's Rushton. a good example. I didn't know yeah. she started there either. Yeah. So she, I think we talked about one of hers, like, she was one of my favorites a couple of years ago. And Every Breath You Take, maybe, yes. or I can't remember. Yeah. It's something like that. We'll right. put it so in the show notes. So this is a whole series, Fugitive Heroes Topaz Unit. Where all these ex like yeah. CIA people were framed and had to split up and kind of like go all over. And so um Zenobia Hanley is the name of our heroine, just call her Z. And she is up in Alaska. And her neighbor, coincidentally, I just think it's a nice thing, is an ex-Navy SEAL named jo John Lowry. And um the yes. bad guys come for her. Now, the bad guys are essentially like the CIA, but some sort of shadow unit or whatever. And he sees them coming because, like, all of a sudden, a, like, a Black Ops helicopter is, like, hovering over her house, and there are men rappelling out of, you know, oof. You know, and he, like, uses their little two-way radio because they're friends, and he's like, you know, they're coming for you. And he could kind of tell, like, I guess in Alaska, you would just tell if somebody's a fugitive. I don't know. And uh, so she has, like, her little hidey hole. And she, like, escapes out there and, like, sets her own place on fire. And she and John escape. And he and he's like, well, where do you want to go? And he's, they go to Seattle. And it turns out, this is where it got really good. But also very, like, really suspenseful is her, the guy after her was her ex-lover who, like, mm. recruited her to the CIA and she didn't realize he was a psycho. And he is also the father of her daughter who oh. is at, like, a private boarding school in oh, Seattle. no. So she's like, I got to go get my daughter because if they were in her house and recovered her laptop, they would know, right, where her daughter is and he's after her, the daughter. And there was a lot of, like... Kids in danger in this book. And I was, as a yeah. teacher, was kind of like, whoa, man. <laughs> but I was really on the edge of my seat and had to keep reading. And so John and Z and the daughter go on the run, and they're trying to figure out, like, how they can get the evidence they need to, like, bring down this, like, shadow ops unit and kill a bunch of bad guys. Now, this is one of a series, and so it's not the end of the series, so... I have to go back and read some of the previous ones before I figure out how they get them all at the end. But it was great. And I was like, wow, it really was action-packed, Sarah. I mean, because it sounds like what they do is they just, they're like, how do I make it, ha like, again, yeah. 
how do I make it bigger? How do I make it more wild? How do right. I make sure the pages keep turning? But instead you, of Greek billionaires, it's like bad guys. Yeah. Oh, it's just like I love it. pure nonstop, like on the run. And, you know, she's a hacker and all this stuff. It was, it was, uh, I, I love it. it. It was great. Okay. So, Sarah, let's talk about it. So, was it our anti hair? What it was the yes, episode? It was our anti heroine episode. Yes. Anti hero. Maybe. And um, there was a brief discussion about, about patriarchy. About, yeah. And why women are not really, I don't know, treated this way, I guess, right? Well, it was about unlikable heroines, right? Yeah. It was about right. this whole concept of like, yeah. What we will accept from heroes versus what we will accept from heroines. And, and as readers, broadly. Right. And one of our listeners, who's also an author, Julie Jim. Elizabeth Leto. Okay. Leto. I'm not sure if it's Leto or Leto. I'm sorry, Julie. I don't know. Um, wrote in a really long thread about how she wrote her, like, a an assassin heroine back in a Harlequin Blaze back in 2006. And how it was, like, one of those things where she felt like this is what she was asked to produce. And then, like, sort of it got buried. And you and I both ordered one. Instantly I got mine from Thrift it. Books. Yeah. Same. It's called The Domino Effect. And yeah. I want to just point out, it's not just a blaze. It's it an is. extreme blaze. Which I don't think I'd ever seen before. But I was like, I like that. I know. And it was, it was sexy. It was sexy. I'm down. And Domino is a professional assassin who yeah. ha is hired by the United States of America yeah. to go in and, like, basically black ops. Yeah, kill people. People who they think are partnering with terrorists. I found her hugely sympathetic from the jump, right? Me too. And Julie had said, like, she wrote this piece. Julie, part of what sold this book to me was Julie saying to us, I believe this is one of my best books. Yes. And it just got, it got no attention because readers just hated her. And, and I was like, I did not find that no. at all. But I like a heroine who's complicated. Yeah. Well, and the thing that's really interesting about this book is, so for, she was recruited at 15, which she just thought was kind of normal, but through the process of kind of going through the book, realizes like, maybe that wasn't really okay for you to be recruiting, like, sort of edgy teenagers, right? But that uh -huh. is a very common backstory. Um, there's, like, for a, men. For men, right? Well, like it's I read Jason this, Bourne. Yeah, I read this Orphan X series where he's yeah. re recruited as a child. Or and, that, um, yeah. And I think this, uh, I, but what's interesting about this also, and what I think probably was so interesting to me and so compelling to me and something that, like, we don't see almost ever is we've, when we see assassins on page who are men, we expect, we're not surprised when they, like, seduce women. Yes. As part of the job. Right. But, like, Domino, so Domino, essentially, there is a nightclub owner named Luke, and he is the hero. And, and he is thought to be selling secrets to Al-Qaeda. And so she basically is sent in there to, like, Figure it out, but also kill him. Like, right. Well, it's pretty much a kill him situation, but she has to seduce him first. Right. Because for the first time, she is being sent in not just essentially as like an assassin only, but on like a recon. So it's kind of like we're not entirely sure. We know that his club is the nexus of this trade, but... So we're willing, but so we need to send someone in who can sort of investigate. And she is really interesting, has like a like a through line of this book is her, like, are they promoting me? Right? Mm -hmm. Like I've always basically been, a, you know, you go in, I kill the person and I turn around and I leave. I've never had to make friends with the people who I might have to kill. I've never had to seduce one. And it's really fascinating that she is essentially a little ambivalent about what she perceives as a possible promotion in yeah. the dark ops world. Yeah. Because she's really worried, like, do I want this? And at the same time, she also realizes that they are, like, questioning her in a way they didn't before. There's one point where she's, like, talking to her handler. And he's like, well, 
what's your plan? And she's like, I've never had to disclose my plans before, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they trusted me to run the op I saw fit because they knew what the outcome would be. But now they're, like, looking for some different outcome. And it's really, really fascinating, in particular, like, just that she's so matter-of-fact about her job. But I want to talk about this first sex scene. I don't know. Because it's... I've never read anything like it, right? Because she, they're having sex, and as he finishes, she turns her ring around and smacks it into his neck, and it's like a a, a toxin that knocks him out for knocks two hours. Out. So, she, so can she can look around. Yeah, but she's still like, that's pretty great, kind of a bummer, but now I have to go to work. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, it, it does. Was amazing. A, this book does a lot of really interesting things. And did you read the author's note? Yes, because um, there's a the book often these books begin with a note from the editor. Yes, um, but this book begins with a note from Julie herself, and it's interesting because I feel like I've read Julie's books before, like okay. in category, but clearly some of them are more like books that Julie feels really drawn to writing. Yeah, and in it she says that she's read that she's written. Um, a former heroin addict heroine, too, in Up to yes. No Good. And I feel like we don't see heroines with these kinds of, I mean, I guess we would say flaws, like, right. or past, or, like, backgrounds. I, I don't yeah, know how to right. describe what, how, I don't know what the word is, but heroines who, truly, like, we accept so much from heroes. Yeah. Um, And... I mean, I don't know. Maybe we would question. Maybe we would think twice about a hero who then like knock, who had sex with the heroine, and then right. knocked the heroine out at the end of the sex scene. But maybe that is a thing that interestingly we can only see done in the reverse. Right. Right. right? Um, but man, yeah, I felt the same way. I really loved. I loved this whole book. It's so different than yes. every other blaze. Yes. I mean. I, the only, my only thought was like, gosh, I wish this was more. Yeah. Like, I would yeah. read a whole series. I would read Domino and Luke forever, right? Like, yes. I would do like, what I want is like the J.R., the um, the J.D. Robb version of this. Yeah, right. Again, it's 2006, right? Mm -hmm. So it's however many years old now is, um, there was like a secondary anti-romance, right? Between the bouncer who is married man, his wife yep, is yep. pregnant. Yep. And this young waitress who has her eye on him. And he, he's like, I like try, and we get there, both of their points of view. Uh -huh. There's and it was, so much in this book. Uh, I can only implore the good people at Military Industrial Complex slash Harlequin to put this <laughs> book in E. Because I, I don't think, it's not, right? Like, you and I, like, found these on thrift no, books. No, what I, I want, was though, I'm fascinated gonna, by this book. What I want is I want Julie to get it. I want to get her to get the rights back. Yes. And then I want her to build, like, I want her to write another 100 words, 100, yes. 100 pages, and then put it out again. Because I, I feel like she, I feel like she has more of yes. the story. Well, and, and it's great. Yeah. And then come on the podcast, Julie. We'll sell a bunch of copies for you. Oh, my God. I mean, so everybody, I, I, it's really funny that you and I both... So I had had this. I ordered it at some point. Me and then too, when and I was, then I picked it up this week. I was like, well, this is the week to read it. And now I'm so glad I did and so mad I, I know. didn't and earlier. And I'm going to read, right? like, way more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy that other, oh, the yeah. other uh, one, too. A hundred percent. But even, like, just I was really thinking about it, like... Use of the secondary anti-romance as a way of shining the light on what is happening in the main romance was also mm -hmm. fascinating, right? I, I... Well, those secondary romance, I mean, that... It just proves that Julie's good at the job, right? Like, yeah. secondary romances should only be there to, like, show right. you something about the main romance. And, yeah. And, I mean, but my... The, as I was reading it, for me, it was just like, there is so much in this book. Oh, and not yeah. just, like, dialing it up to 11, although there is certainly... The, I mean, like, the sure. idea itself is dialing it up to 11. But it, it's just the layers of this book are remarkable. Remarkable. And it's done in... Let me look. 
what, 240 pages? pages. Yeah. Yes. I mean, just right from the jump. Right from the jump. It's just really compelling. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, that was like a great way to end. And I think that's the other thing uh, I keep thinking about is there's something really interesting to me, Sarah, about how memorable these books are. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because they really are so, like, leaning into the fantasy of everything being at 11, right? That makes something memorable. These are memorable books. Yeah, I mean, I just think some of us, I don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like when I was a kid, I don't know if it's a chicken or an egg thing. But I feel like I was so drawn to all these books when I was young because, like, I had these, like, fantasies of having this, like, dialed to 11 life. Like, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, I agree. And I don't know if I had them because I read the books or if I read the books because I had those fantasies. But, like, the books definitely informed those fantasies in many, many ways. And I think reading them gives me a lot of joy because... You know, life is not dialed to 11 for any of us, really. I mean, it's certainly not dialed to 11 for me. And, like, thankfully, right? Like, it's not like I want to, you know, it's not like <laughs> I want all my male models to be in jail tomorrow <laughs> for my most important day. I don't want anyone bring, breaking down my door with a tree. They exactly. It's fine. Um, but, man, is it a fun ride. And, like, I just feel... Gosh, I just feel like I want, I want, I think romance in many ways was served through the 90s and early aughts by the fact that so many writers came up through category. Yeah. Um, and I say that as somebody who came in after yeah. the, the category pathway was not the only pathway, right. right? But I think what category really did for romance writers was teach them, like, yeah. the bones, the, yeah. the conflict, the character, the voice, the pacing, mm -hmm. the, way you, the way you end a chapter, the way yes. you provide information without overwhelming readers, the mm -hmm. way you dial it all up to 11. Like, oh, we right. saw and we continue to see in authors like, you know, all the ones that I named, the willingness to do that work, to translate that work okay. from or transfer that work from their category, yes, you know, experiences to their single title experiences. And so I would say if you're out there, I know a lot of people who listen to the podcast are writers or and are trying to get published. And what I would say is if you are out there and you are working on a manuscript, it would not, you would not be out of line to go pick up a half a dozen <laughs> categories that look entertaining and spend a week just like every night read one before bed. Wow, what a delight. Yeah. I was delighted by it. Yeah. Same. I just had a great time. I really had. I, I'm not going to stop, I don't think. Like, I, no, I am not I either. downloaded... Four or five of those Harlequin bundles. All presents, by the way. Well, listen, presents. And now, and I literally am just like, okay, I'm just going <laughs> to keep doing this. I I can't even tell you how. Like, I it, it I think there's a, there's a, there's a way in which I feel like young again reading them. Like, I just, or, well, and, the, and I think, do evoke that. Yeah, it feels you know, how it felt when we were this young. This is how it felt to read these books. This is, it just felt spectacular and amazing. And the whole world was just, oh, romance reasons. Terrific. So fun. Terrific. So tell us um, who your favorite category authors are writing now. Um, drop recommendations on Twitter at yes. Beta Mates or on Instagram at Beta Mates Pod or on Tumblr at Beta Mates. Um, and, or you can always do it in the comments on betamates.net. Right. We're seeing more and more people commenting there, which is great. Yeah, we, we saw that it. there's some, like, 
some some people are having some trouble with like the like and reply function. We're trying to figure it out. We think it has something to do with Safari versus other uh, browsers. So if you're having trouble in Safari, try it from browser over there. Jen and I are also going to try and be more present in the comment section um, on the on the website. So uh, yeah, let us know there. If you write categories and you ever want to just you know shoot us a book. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. Are you kidding? It's amazing. If you're out there and you work for Harlequin and you want to send us more categories, just send me in. a big box of Harlequin presents. You'll never <laughs> see me again. I live here now. Uh, I'm sorry this... I called you the military industrial complex. I love you. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's sure. fine. Uniformly hot. Uniformly hot. Amazing. Exclamation point. Anyway, yeah. I'm Sarah McLean. I'm here with my friend Jen Prokop. We are Fated Mates. Thanks to this week's sponsors, Desiree, Nicole, and Lumi Labs. You can support us by supporting them. Have a great week, everyone.